targeting of conservative groups at this point to return to the U.S. Senate. A quick reminder that you can see all of this hearing and all the IRS hearings online anytime at cspan.org. The U.S. Senate about to gavel back into session. More work is expected on the Farm Bill. Now live to the Senate floor here on C-SPAN 2. Madam President. The Senator from Arizona. Madam President, the, the Senate, I am learning, is an institution bound by tradition and precedent. One of the time-honored and worthwhile traditions in this body is that new Senators, for at least the first few months of their service, are to be essentially seen and not heard until they deliver their maiden speeches on the Senate floor. This, Madam President, I am doing today. As an aside, in the same vein of new senators traditionally not being heard but seen, I may have been well advised for the few, first few months of my service to avoid the throngs of reporters that congregate outside of this chamber. But it's too late for that. Politicians, after all, can only heed so much advice. For the first 12 years, or for the past 12 years, it was my privilege to serve in the House of Representatives, a body that has its own traditions and precedents. At its core, the House is governed by the concept of majority rule. One party can have a majority of only one or two, and by virtue of the rules, can still maintain control of that body. During my time in the House, I had the experience of being both in the majority and in the minority. All things equal, I preferred the former. But I understood that the power wielded by being in the majority is fleeting. That is as it should be. The Senate, on the other hand, is a body governed by consensus. The party holding the gavel is on a short leash, bringing even the most non-controversial resolutions to the floor, to the Senate floor, requires the agreement or at least the acquiescence of the minority party. Over the past decades, both parties have chafed under these, these arrangements. Both parties have at times considered changing the rules that would in some way make the Senate more like the House. Both parties have wisely reconsidered. The House has rules appropriate for the House. The rules of the Senate, however frustrating to the party that happens to wield the gavel, are appropriate for the Senate. I come to this point with great appreciation for those Arizona Senators who have preceded me. The 48th state in the Union, Arizona celebrated its centennial just last year. 
Prior to my swearing in this year, Arizona had sent just 10 senators to this body. These Arizonans that came before me left more of an impression than simply carving their names in these desks. Few in this body have matched the longevity of Carl Hayden. Few have had the lasting impact of Barry Goldwater, who helped launch the conservative movement. I consider it a high honor to follow in the footsteps of Senator John Kyle, whose steady, principled leadership shaped Arizona for the better and made our nation stronger and more secure. My constituents now call the same telephone number I answered as an intern for Senator Dennis DeConcini. He taught me a great deal about constituent service. And now I have the incredible honor to serve with Senator John McCain, who has, as a prisoner of war, taught us all the meaning of sacrifice. Since that time, he has served Arizona, the country, and the Senate nobly and honorably. Fortunately for all of us, his service to this institution continues. It is my great privilege to serve with him. The challenges America faces today are legion and growing. Abroad, cells of terrorists bent on our destruction continue to incubate. Some receive aid and comfort from countries with long-held grievances and irreconcilable enmity toward the United States. Other terrorists take advantage of failed states and lawless regions to hatch their plans. But it is not just individual terrorists or terror cells that we have to worry about. Countries unbound by the norms and conventions of traditional nation states now threaten the peace. Today, our concern is primarily focused on Iran and North Korea, but myriad other countries are but one election or coup removed from boiling over into regional and international instability. Here at home, our fiscal situation is dire. We continue to spend considerably more than we take in. Worse yet, we have no serious plan to remedy the problem in any structural way. We seem to endlessly lurch from cliff to crisis and back again with fiscal high-wire acts that erode the confidence of markets and invite the disdain of our constituents. It is understandable that with two-year election cycles, the House of Representatives begins to focus on the next election as soon as one election is finished. In the House, difficult issues are often avoided or perpetually shelved until the next election. But here in the Senate, we have six-year terms. Senators, therefore, should come with an added dose of courage to take up the thorny and vexing issues on which the other chamber takes a pass. It is our responsibility to lead, and if there was ever a time for this body, this chamber, the United States Senate to lead, this is it. I am a proud and unapologetic conservative and a Republican, and I hope my votes will consistently reflect that philosophy. So I'm not suggesting that we hold hands and agree on every issue, or even most issue. Issues. There are proud, I'm sorry, there are pro profound and meaningful differences between the parties. But I want to spend more time exercising my franchise while debating the legislation itself, and less time on deciding whether such leg legislation should be debated on the Senate floor. There is a time and a place for using supermajority rules to block legislation and or nominees from coming to the Senate floor. There is a time and a place for partisanship, but not every time and not every place. This country yearns for a functioning Senate, a Senate that recognizes the gravity of our fiscal situation and its responsibility to propose and adopt measures to solve it for the long term. This country yearns for a Senate that exercises its prerogative as part of the first branch of government to rein in executive branch excesses in both domestic and foreign affairs. Domestically, the parade of missteps and abuses at the IRS and other federal agencies stand as Exhibit A of the need for a more robust legislative direction and oversight. Recent presidents, both Republican and Democratic, have exercised authority in the foreign arena far beyond that contemplated for a commander-in-chief often obligating future Congresses to financial commitments far beyond security arrangements. 
a better functioning Senate, less distracted by games of shirts and skins, would not countenance such theft of its authority. Now is not the time, Mr. President, Madam President, for this institution to retreat into irrelevance, where the sum of our influence is to sign off on another continuing resolution to fund the government for another six months, where success is measured by how well our tracks are covered when the debt ceiling is raised, where prioritizing spending cuts are avoided by invoking another sequester. No, we've been there, done that. It's time now for the Senate to lead. There are encouraging signs that we may be moving in this direction. Earlier this year, a budget was passed by this chamber. It wasn't a budget that I preferred, but I was given ample opportunity to offer and debate amendments to that legislation, as were my Republican colleagues. We came up short, but at least the Senate got back to regular order. In the coming weeks, this body will consider an immigration bill. Immigration reform has been, has been and remains a complex and vexing issue with members holding strong and discordant views on many of its facets. Still, a bill having had a thorough vetting in committee will now be allowed to come to the Senate floor to be debated, amended, and hopefully improved upon. This is the way it should work. To conclude, Madam President, in the few days a few days after last November's election, the 12 newly elected Senate freshmen were invited to the National Archives. We were taken to the legislative vault where we viewed the original signed copies of the first bill enacted by Congress, as well as other landmark pieces of legislation and memorabilia. Oaths of allegiances signed by Revolutionary War soldiers, witnessed by General Washington, documents and artifacts related to the Civil War, segregation, and women's suffrage were also on hand. It was an affirmation to me of the tumultuous seas through which our ship of state has sailed for more than 200 years. We have had many brilliant and inspired individuals at the helm and trimming the sails along the way. We've also had personalities ranging from mediocre to malevolent. But our system of government has survived them all. Serious challenges lie ahead, but any honest reckoning of our history and our prospects will note that we have confronted and survived more daunting challenges than we now face. This is a durable, resilient system of government designed to withstand the foibles of men, including yours truly. Madam President, it is an honor of a lifetime just to be here in this storied institution, more than I could have ever hoped for. My modest hope going forward is that my contributions will, in some small way, honor the Senate's storied past and help it realize its full potential as the world's most deliberative body. Thank you. I yield the floor.
President. Senator from Connecticut. Are we in a quorum call? We are not. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, first let me congratulate Senator Flake uh, on his main speech. Uh, very thoughtful and I think uh, a challenge to this body to uh, get back to the work that it has been, um, uh, it has been given by the American people. Um, Madam President, I come to the floor today to once again talk about the 4,670 victims of gun violence that we have seen across this country since December 14th. December 14th is a date that everyone in Connecticut knows, but as time goes by, maybe fades from the memories of other Americans, that is the day in which a deranged young man walked into Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, and gunned down 26 and 7-year-olds, in addition to six teachers and education professionals that were charged with taking care of those kids, a day that none of us will ever forget. And we came to the floor of the Senate in the weeks and months that followed with the intention of passing legislation that would make sure that we did everything within our power to assure that another Sandy Hook didn't happen somewhere else in this country. But we also were endeavoring to do something about the all too routine gun violence that has plagued our cities and our suburbs, frankly, almost every community in this country. This is a stunning number, Madam President. Since December 14th of last year, in just over six months, 4,670 people have died from gun violence. And during that time, the United States Senate and the House of Representatives have done nothing to try to change that reality. Now, I will at least give this body credit. We debated a bill in the Judiciary Committee. We brought it to the Senate floor, and because of the rules of this place, unfortunately, 55 votes was not enough to get a gun violence package passed that would have imposed criminal background checks on thousands of gun purchases that now operate without, outside that system that would have made it a federal crime to illegally traffic in guns that would have placed more resources in the hands of mental health professionals. At least we tried in the Senate to do it. The House, on the other hand, has taken no steps to try to cut down on the 4,670 deaths all across this country just in the last six months. So, Madam President, what I've tried to do every week since the failure of that bill is to come down to the floor of the Senate and instead of talking over and over again about the policy implications or the different ways and paths that we can get to a gun violence package. Instead, I think it's important just to talk about the victims. Who are these 4,670 people? Because their stories really should be the ones that move this place to action. Stories like that of Matthew Tardo, who died just a few days ago, uh, May 24th, age 16. He was killed implausibly by his father. His 52-year-old father killed his 16-year-old son in an apparent murder-suicide. Matthew was an amazing young man. He was a backup offensive lineman for his high school, John Curtis Christian School. He was a superior track and field athlete. He was an honor roll student, and his friends called him just a happy-go-lucky kid. They said he always had a smile on. His football coach said, quote, this kind of thing is unbelievable, that something like this could happen. The only way we know how to get through this is with deep prayer. I just feel so heartbroken, not only for his family, but for the kids, his friends, and his teammates. You know, we talk a lot about the fact that well, it's important to change gun laws, there are others that say that all of our emphasis should be on early intervention, that our mental health system should be the sole focus of this place so that we can stop these murders before they happen. But as we know, often we can't see these things coming 
And the case of Matthew Tardo was an illustration of this. Neighbors said that they never saw any signs of trouble from this household. In fact, one neighbor remembers seeing the father and the son taking walks together through the neighborhood just days and weeks before this happened. Matthew's probably going to be a pretty amazing guy, honor roll student, great athlete, friendly, happy-go-lucky kid. But in an awful murder-suicide, he's taken from us as well as his father. Another 16-year-old, three days beforehand, was gunned down in a backyard in a neighborhood of Chicago. Angel Cano was killed with a gunshot wound to the head. He was pronounced dead on the scene, according to the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office. His father had brought his oldest son to Chicago from Mexico in 2004 in search of a better life. His father said that his son just desperately wanted to be someone. His son, at 16 year old, had dreams of becoming a singer or a professional soccer player. He was always down at the local soccer fields, playing soccer endlessly, teaching other young kids how to be better soccer players. At 16, he still had this dream. And yet, at 16 years old, apparently on the way back from the soccer fields that evening, he was gunned down. The police have said it may be gang-related, but the family says that Angel was never, ever affiliated with any gangs. And then lastly, the story of Jamica Woods. Ms. Woods was 37 years old, and the night before she died on May 20th, her boyfriend uploaded pictures onto his Facebook page of a shotgun that he had bought at Walmart, along with pictures of a shotgun shell that he bought at that same Walmart. He uploaded the pictures because he had already set about a plan to kill his girlfriend the next night. According to police, Ms. Woods had taken out an emergency protective order against her boyfriend last December, but she had never gone about the process of finalizing it. She was in the process of kicking her boyfriend out when she got killed, and had she just taken a few more steps it's possible that he would have never been able to buy that gun in the first place. And if she had taken those steps to fill out a protective order, and if that order had been filed, and if the Walmart had run a background check and found that protective order, it's possible that she would still be alive today. Frankly, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of men and women across this country who are alive today because of that law, because of that law that came so very close to saving Jamica Woods. A protective order being filed due to domestic violence, a gun purchase being stopped because of that order. One of the reasons that we have that law on the books today is the advocacy of Senator Frank Lautenberg. Senator Frank Lautenberg, who died this week, made it his life's cause to try to make the streets of his state of New Jersey safer. He was advocating right up until his final days on the floor of this house to enact a ban on high-capacity magazines like the one that killed 20 little six- and seven-year-olds in Connecticut. But he was successful in passing through this chamber a piece of legislation that keeps guns out of the hands of people who have been convicted of domestic violence. It is a law that has worked. It is a law that has saved the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of men and women all across this country. And it's a reminder that this place can do something about the 4,670 people who have died since Newtown due to gun violence. Frank Lautenberg knew that this place had the power to save lives by enacting common sense gun violence legislation. In his case, just a simple rule that if you've been convicted of domestic violence, maybe you shouldn't get your hands on a gun. Senator Lautenberg's work is a reminder that whether it's next month, later this year, or next year, we still have work to do 
should try to honor the memories of the thousands of victims of gun violence all across this country. I yield back the floor. Suggest the, the senator from Michigan. Suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Ms. Baldwin. Senator from Vermont. If there is a quorum call, I would ask that it be vitiated. Without objection. Uh, Madam President, um, I rise this afternoon to say a few words about the uh, immigration reform bill that, as I understand it, uh, we will begin discussing uh, next week. Uh, and as the son of an immigrant, somebody who came to this country at the age of 17, without a nickel in his pocket and who was able to send his two kids to college, needless to say, I support uh, immigration. Uh, our country is unique in the world. Our country is great because, in fact, we are the sons and daughters of immigrants, uh, and I think we should all be very proud of that. Um, I also want to uh, commend the Judiciary Committee, Senator Leahy and Senator Schumer and Senator Durbin and all of those people who have been working very, very hard on uh, what I consider to be a good and strong uh, immigration reform bill. Um, and here are some of the very strong components of that bill that I would hope that every member of the Senate would support, and that is uh, the need for a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country. Uh, bringing undocumented workers out of the shadows and giving them legal status will make it more difficult for employers to undercut the wages and benefits of all workers uh, and, in my view, will be good for the entire economy. Uh, I have always and continue to strongly support the DREAM Act, part of the Immigration Reform Bill, to make sure that children of illegal immigrants who are brought into this country by their parents years and years ago are allowed to become citizens. Uh, I strongly support a number of the provisions that deal with agriculture. Uh, some years ago, Madam President, I was in uh, Immokalee, Florida, uh, where I suspect you have some of the most exploited workers in America who pick the tomatoes that go to the fast food uh, restaurants throughout this country. And I can tell you that in the state of Vermont, uh, we have dairy farms now that are dependent upon a foreign labor. And it's important that we treat those workers with dignity, that we give them legal status. So making sure that we can come to uh, an approach which provides legal status uh, for agricultural workers is extremely important. Uh, and I obviously support making sure that our borders are strong uh, and that we stop illegal immigration as best we can. And I applaud the committee for including all of those provisions uh, in the uh, immigration bill that's going to come uh, to the Senate, I expect, next week. But let me, uh, Mr. President, uh, tell you what I worry about very much and have deep concerns about in terms of the current legislation. Let us be clear that while we have made a good step forward in terms of improving our economy, as to where it was in the midst of the financial crisis, uh, we still have a long, long way to go. Uh, real unemployment in America is not 7.5 percent. That's official unemployment. Real unemployment is closer to 14 percent if you include those people who have given up looking for work in high unemployment areas and people who are working part-time when they want to work full-time. In other words, if you include unemployment among minorities in this country, uh, if you include the unemployment rates among young people in this country, we continue to have a very, very serious 
unemployment problem in the United States of America. It's an issue that we have got to deal with, and I have a number of ideas on how to deal with it. Deal with it. But one thing we sure as heck do not want to do is make a bad situation worse. So it seems to me that at a moment when our middle class continues to disappear, when millions of workers are working longer hours for lower wages, when median family income has gone down by $5,000 since 1999, it does not make a lot of sense to me that we have an immigration reform bill which includes a massive increase in temporary guest worker programs that will allow large multinational corporations to import hundreds of thousands of temporary blue collar and white collar guest workers into this country from overseas. So one of my major concerns here is that I think uh, corporate America is kind of using immigration reform as a means to continue their effort to lower wages in the United States of America and we must not allow that to happen. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we all know that we have a serious crisis in terms of the high cost of college education. It's another issue that we're going to be dealing with uh, soon on the floor. Uh, but one thing that I can say, and I suspect that I speak for a number of other members in Congress, is that when we needed uh, to get some financial help in order to pay for college, if we didn't come from families that had a lot of money, we worked summer times. That's what we did. And uh, I find it uh, alarming that within this bill, we are looking at a situation uh, in which we are importing a lot of uh, young people from Europe and elsewhere uh, into jobs that young people in this country need in the summertime and elsewhere to allow them to get going in terms of their careers and allowing them to make a few bucks in order to help them with their college uh, education. Uh, I understand that jobs like being a waiter or a waitress or a busboy, and I did some of that when I was a kid, are not glamorous jobs. Uh, but you know what? They help you a little bit uh, paying for college. And, and it's the same with jobs like being a lifeguard or uh, working at a front desk at a hotel or a resort or being a ski instructor, or being a cook, or being a chef, or working in a kitchen, or being a chambermaid, or a landscaper. I understand these are not glamorous jobs that pay huge amounts of money. But if you have to figure out how you're going to pay to go to college in the fall, those jobs help. If you need some experience in getting a career off the ground, those jobs help. And I am really concerned that kids in this country are going to be looking for jobs and employers are going to say, well, actually we don't have any jobs. That job has been filled by some young person from Eastern Europe. Uh, so I want us to take uh, that issue into account. Um, I also find it painful to see the J-1 program, which theoretically is supposed to bring young people into this country to learn about our culture. It's a program to expose young people from around the world to American culture. That is a good thing. I believe in that. I believe young people in America should have the opportunity to go abroad. People from around the world, young people should have the opportunity to learn about America. Good thing. But I fear very much that this J-1 program is being exploited by corporations like Hershey's and McDonald's uh, and, and as an effort to simply bring students from abroad to work at low-paying jobs in the United States. Uh, Mr. President, supporters of the temporary H-2B guest worker program claim that there are not enough Americans uh, willing to do these types of jobs. That in essence, what they are really saying is the American people are too lazy, young people are too lazy uh, to work in these jobs. I don't accept that. I truly do not accept it. And I think it is a slap in the face not only to our young people, but to many, many working people who do not have much education, who want to go out and work and earn some money to say, no, 
Uh, we're going to have to bring people in from abroad to do those jobs. Uh, jobs like waiters and waitresses uh, and uh, chambermaids and lifeguards, these are not high-tech skilled jobs. These are jobs that our young people can do and need to do. So I have a great concern about the transformation of the J-1 program from being a program dealing with American culture to being one where corporations are exploiting young people from abroad uh, to work in low-paid jobs in the United States. Uh, I also find it uh, interesting uh, that, um, that instead of raising wages in this country to attract workers, what many of these companies are doing is bringing in people from abroad. You know, what supply and demand is about, and what we learned at Economics 101 in college, is that if an employer cannot find a certain type of worker, the way you in, entice that worker is you raise wages. But instead of raising wages, what employers are doing is saying, we got huge amounts of cheap labor all over the world. And instead of raising wages for American workers, we're going to bring in cheap labor from around the world. Uh, and I think that that is wrong. And I think uh, as we deal with this legislation, it's an issue we have got to uh, address front and, se and center. Uh, when we talk about H-2B jobs, what we're talking about are people who work in landscaping. We're talking about amusement park workers. We're talking about housekeepers, waiters, and waitresses. Further, during the summer, uh, businesses are using guest worker programs to hire young people from other countries to be lifeguards. To be lifeguards. Now, maybe I am mistaken, but I kind of think there are young people in this country who can work as lifeguards uh, in, 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 and hold other positions in some of the resorts uh, all over this country. And we're talking about ski instructors in Vermont. I can tell you, uh, Mr. President, that in the state of Vermont, we have a whole lot of young people who are very good at skiing, who can teach skiing, and we don't need people from Europe to take those jobs away from young Americans. Uh, Mr. President, let me be clear, uh, and I find this to be interesting, if not ironic, and that is that the same corporations and businesses who support a massive expansion in guest worker programs just coincidentally happen to be the same exact corporations who are opposed to raising the minimum wage, the same corporations who support the outsourcing of American jobs, the same corporations that in some cases have reduced wages and benefits for American workers at a time when corporate America is making record-breaking profits. In too many cases, the H-2B program for lowest skilled guest workers and the H-1B program for high skilled guest workers are being used by employers to drive down the wages and benefits of American workers and to replace American workers with cheap labor from abroad. And here's what it comes down to. It comes down to supply and demand. And if the employers of this country need labor, let them start raising wages for American workers rather than bringing in cheap labor from all over this world. The immigration reform bill that passed the Senate Judiciary Committee could increase the number of low-skilled. Now, we're not talking, and I hear speeches here, that we're going to have these genius, high-tech guys who are going to start companies and create all kinds of jobs. Great. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about an immigration reform bill from the Judiciary Committee that could increase the number of low-skilled guest workers by as much as 800 percent over the next five years and could more than triple the number of temporary white-collar guest workers coming into this country. During the next five years, H-1B high-skilled visas could go from 85,000 to as many as 230,000. The number of H-2B low-skilled visas could go from 65,000 to as many as 325,000. And the new W visa program for low-skilled workers could go as high as 200,000. So the first question that members have got to ask ourselves 
and the American people have got to ask ourselves, is unemployment throughout America, in Arizona or Oklahoma, Vermont, Michigan, is it so low that right now we desperately need more and more foreign workers to fill jobs that Americans can't fill? Now, the high-tech industry tells us that they need the H-1B program so they can hire the best and the brightest science, technology, engineering, and math workers in the world, and that there aren't enough qualified American workers in these fields. And let me be the first to admit, in some cases, I believe that that is true. I've spoken to employers in Vermont. I suspect it is true all over this country that there are areas where companies cannot find the skilled workers that they need. They need employees from abroad. And to the degree that's true, let us address that issue. But let us also give you some facts which suggest that that not, may not be quite as true as some of the employers and corporations are saying. Mr. President, in 2010, 54% of H-1B guest workers were employed in entry-level jobs. So the argument is, hey, we need all of these brilliant guys who are going to start companies, create jobs. 54% in 2010 of the H-1B guest workers were employed in entry-level jobs and performed, and I quote, routine tasks requiring limited judgment, end of quote, according to the Government Accountability Office. In 2010, the official U.S. unemployment rate averaged more than 9.6% per month. Why couldn't these type of jobs be performed by Americans? So again, the point is, I know some of my friends saying, every one of these guys is some genius who's going to start a company. I wish that were the case. Many of these are lower wage, entry level jobs that certainly American workers could do. Further, only 6 point, only 6 percent of H-1B visas were given to workers with highly specialized skills in 2010. That's the issue I keep hearing about, highly specialized skill, but only 6 percent of H-1B visas went to those folks. More than 80 percent of H-1B guest workers are paid wages that are less than American workers in comparable positions, according to the Economic Policy Institute. Over 9 million Americans have degrees in a STEM-related field, but only about 3 million have a job in that area. Last year, Mr. President, the top 10 employers of H-1B guest workers were all offshore outsourcing companies. Let me repeat that. One of the great crises that we have faced in the last 30 years is the companies have shut down in America, moved abroad, and got cheap labor abroad. The top 10 employers of H-1B guest workers were all offshore outsourcing companies. These firms are responsible for shipping huge numbers of American information technology jobs to India and other countries. Nearly half of all H-1B visas go to offshore outsourcing firms, while less than 3 percent of them apply to become permanent residents. Further, half of all recent college graduates majoring in computer and information service, information science in the United States did not receive jobs in the information technology sector. So in other words, we have large numbers of Americans who are graduating with degrees that can handle these jobs, and yet we're bringing in large numbers of people from abroad to do them. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Mr. President, not only would the Senate immigration bill greatly expand the number of H-1B guest workers, it also would provide an unlimited number of green cards to foreign graduates who receive a master's degree or a PhD in a STEM-related field. If we are going to provide green cards to every foreign student with an advanced STEM degree, what purpose does the H-1B program serve other than to suppress the wages of American workers who are already struggling? At the very least, I believe we should prohibit offshore outsourcing firms from hiring temporary guest workers. Mr. President, under the Senate Immigration Bill, the number of college-educated H-1B guest workers and STEM green card holders who are under 30 years of age will exceed the number of jobs that are available for young information technology graduates. 
What message does that send to young people in our country who are interested in pursuing careers in information technology? Making matters even worse, I am very concerned that Senator Hatch was able to gut the very modest reforms to the H-1B program designed to prevent companies from replacing American workers with H-1B guest workers. At a minimum, it is essential that those pro-worker reforms be put back into the bill before, before it is passed by the full Senate. Uh, Mr. President, this country was built by immigrants. I'm a son of an immigrant, many of us are. We are a nation, I believe, that wants to see comprehensive immigration reform passed. I certainly do. And again, I want to congratulate all of those people who have worked on this bill because there are a lot of very, very important and positive provisions in there. But Mr. President, I think we have to improve that bill as it leaves committee and as it comes down here to the floor of the Senate. What we want to make certain is that at a time when this country continues to struggle economically, when millions of people are working longer hours for lower wages, when minority unemployment is just extraordinarily high, we do not want to take any action that lowers wages or increases unemployment for American workers. So I think, again, my congratulations to those who worked on this bill, but we have a whole lot of work to do as the bill reaches the floor, and I intend to be working with my colleagues to make those improvements. And with that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Arizona. Mr. President, I say to the Senator from Vermont, um, I appreciate much of what he had to say, and I would look forward to working with him to um, see what, how we can best uh, reflect some of, uh, address some of his uh, very legitimate concerns. I would point out to my friend from Vermont that we are, there is going to be a requirement.